Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Death Row channel. Today's review is of a pretty new book, 2022, written by a young author who's won several major awards. I would call it Steampunk, though she probably would not. <laughs> the writer's previous three books all got critical acclaim, and this is no exception, having won both a Nebula, one of science fiction's highest awards, and Blackwell's Book of the Year. The cover art intrigued me, uh, showing a precariously tall tower in the midst of a 19th century English village. The premise, which is complicated, is clever, and the title is a mouthful, Babel, or The Necessity of Violence, An Arcane History of the Oxford Translator's Revolution. <laughs> the author, and I'm very jealous of her success at this young age, is 27-year-old Rebecca F. Kwong. I love this long Victorian sounding title. From now on, I'm going to call it Babel. <laughs> okay? So, Babel is a historical fantasy that I would consider to be steampunk. However, I'm sure Kwong would not call it that because she sounds very much like one of these people who would say that steampunk is bad because it's colonialist. And that's the thrust of this book is that colonialism is bad. Now, though I have a more nuanced view of uh, colonialism, in particular the British Empire, and I have done a video defending it, at least saying the good things it did. Nonetheless, I'm open-minded. I mean, I'm very willing to hear a different side. And so, I had not heard of this author until Audible recommended the book to me, because, of course, I read a lot of his historical stuff, uh, steampunk included, and historical fiction and fact. It has an interesting premise, a rather complicated one. It's going to take a while to explain it. And it's full of tense drama and fascinating insights on language. Though it is a little long, it is well-researched and skillfully written. Now, despite these many accolades that the book has received, and it's been nominated for a few awards in addition to the ones it won, I have very mixed feelings about it, which I will get into later. First impressions are that it looks like it would be fascinating, in particular because of the premise. It takes place in the 1830s, mostly in England, and the main difference from our world is that there exists magic. <laughs> and this magic, and they don't call it that, is kind of an alchemical um, ability of silver in order to cast spells, and you can do all sorts of things with that, all sorts of useful things. Uh, a skilled silver worker can produce spells to make, for example, gardens grow better, carriages drive faster or more safely, uh, machinery to work longer, and even to make more deadly weaponry. This might sound familiar because it's a lot like The Light Ages by Ian MacLeod. In that case, we had Aether, a mythical element that was used to fuel uh, Britain's fantasy industrial revolution. In this case, it's a little bit more complicated because working spells requires engraving on a silver bar in two different languages, at least two different languages, sometimes more. And this is not one of these elevator speech explanations, so bear with me. To create magic requires, as I said, more than one language. Usually one is English, and the other might be French or German, sometimes even Latin or Greek. And the power in the magic is the subtle difference between two words which are uh, nominally equivalent <laughs> in translation. <laughs> got, got it? Okay, so this is why they need skilled translators to create these pairs of words or phrases, which they call match pairs. So it's not exactly the meaning that is important. It's the subtle difference in meaning. For example, if you had two words that meant uh, safety, and one of them had an implication of emotional safety, you know, one's in English, say, and the other is in, in German, <laughs> the power of the bar would actually be towards emotional security. So it would be like an alternative to psychiatric drugs. You know, you put it in your pocket and you feel fine all day. That's how this silver works. And so there's a lot of stuff about etymology of languages and the subtle differences in meaning, which as a language nerd, I find very interesting. Now, one of the premises is that as these Western languages like English and French grow closer, due to the um, interaction between populations, they're looking for more exotic languages like Chinese and Hindi, where 
the meanings are going to be more stable because a lot of it has to do with the tr translator's state of mind and their understanding of the language. It's kind of this mystical understanding thing that underpins other fantasy uh, stories such as Death Note, <laughs> in which you can you can kill somebody, but you have to keep their mind, your face, and their name in mind when you do it. It's that kind of thing. And so, in this case, they have to have a skilled translator who both speaks English very well and is usually a native speaker in a different language. So, they are now like recruiting young people, because that's the best, because young people absorb languages better, from places like China and India. And the protagonist is, in fact, a young half-Chinese orphan who has been raised in Canton and, for some inexplicable reason, had a tutor, an English-speaking tutor, paid for by a mysterious benefactor. So he speaks English very fluently, and, of course, he's a native speaker of Chinese. So as far as silverwork, the center of silverworking in the world is Oxford, where the famous university is in England. And this is because the British Empire has pretty much cornered the market on this technology, and they have a hoard of much of the world's silver, which helps make the British Empire even more powerful. So again, here's a weird premise, but it's well done. It would be easy to muff this because it's so... Uh, complex, <laughs> but she does a pretty good job of it. And I don't have a problem with political message. I can understand, especially somebody from China, you know, China has a long-standing grudge with England because of the opium wars. And in fact, this author's first book was about that. But I think that the problem with this book is the stridency of the message and the way in which it's it's presented. It could have been done differently such that it was subtler and easier and more palatable for people of all pro political persuasions. But back to the main protagonist. His name is Robin Swift, and yes, he's Chinese, but he's adopted an English name at the insistence of his guardian, because what happens is his, he's, he's living with his mother, who's a single mother and thus disgraced, and when a cholera epidemic sweeps through and kills his mother and the rest of his family, this English guardian swoops in and rescues him and takes him to English and said, you need an English name because, because English can't pronounce Chinese. And so he picks Robin Hood and Jonathan Swift because he's read a lot of English books. So this guardian, whose name is Professor Lovell, he just happens to be an Oxford Don. And we learn very quickly that Robin has been groomed to be a translator because they are very short of Chinese speakers, in particular because the Royal Court of, Court of China has made it illegal to teach foreigners Chinese. So it has to be somebody from China. So he's brought in as a young boy, I think nine or so, and after a few grueling years of study, he is ready for Oxford because he has to be prepared. He has to be brought up to speed. And the professor is very strict and very cold. But we learn very quickly, or we suspect very quickly, that his English father may just happen to be the professor, because they look a lot alike. The boy notices this, but, the, but at any question about who his father is, the professor becomes very angry and won't even entertain the possibility. So there's this first part, which is all about Robin's you know, trials and tribulations in this very strict and very isolated environment. Next, he goes to Oxford. And because he doesn't fit in with his overwhelmingly white male student body, remember, colleges were segregated by sex at the time, he hooks up with a cohort of the most diverse people that are you know, getting into the Oxford Translation Institute at the time. Because this is the most pre prestigious school because they have the power to create magic with silver. And these three other students that are, become his best friends are a Bengali Muslim named Rami, a Haitian girl named Victoire, and an English girl named Letty. Now you notice two of them were women. Well, this is because the translation department really needs translators. So they're willing to admit women. 
but of course they face a lot of discrimination. They have to live way off campus because they're afraid that these these uh, harlots are going to tempt the men, <laughs> and so on. You know, they make a lot of fun of, about that ridiculous assumption. And Letty, though, though she's English, she's diverse because, again, she's a woman, and she's kind of been disowned by her father, who doesn't think that women need an education and would never have paid for it, but Oxford got her a scholarship because she's brilliant. Victoria, of course, has a double whammy of being both female and black. So people really, I mean, at least the English, really dislike her. Now, this next section of the book details the struggles of Robin and his friends to survive both the really grueling Oxford educational system and all the prejudice that they're, they're encountering in their status as outcasts. Uh, they are not well received because practically every white character that we encounter in this book, excluding Letty, maybe, <laughs> is a virulent racist. Uh, even Professor Lovell, who obviously fathered a child there, doesn't really like the Chinese and calls them indolent and lazy and, uh, and uh, had no warmth or fatherly feeling to Robin whatsoever. And so... This brings me to the book's main flaw. The author is so strident in her views on colonialism and racism that she paints such a one-sided view of English society. You know, though I do believe our protagonists would have encountered problems, it just seems so exaggerated, like everybody is so, you know, so angry and so hateful against them. And, you know, England didn't have this really checkered history like America did, where we had all these slaves in the country. England kept its slavery mostly offshore. <laughs> and uh, and they all and we also had the Native Americans. And whereas England, you know, they had the Scots and the Welsh very and the Irish very close to them. So it seems to me that there's a lot of grudging animosity against the English. And this is the prime reason I think this book should not have gotten the Nebula Award. And I'll give you a case in point. Imagine you had a book written about Jamaica, takes place in Jamaica, and all of the black Jamaicans in the books are villains, and they are the only villains in the book. Like they're all bad. They all have some terrible, you know, terrible quality to them. Even if they look like they're good people, they are secretly you know, secretly violent and scheming and hateful. Well, I would consider that book to be racist, and I would not give it a recommendation. And, you know, I, if I reviewed it, it would probably be to criticize it. Well, it's the same thing with the English in this book. It is so strident, and it wasn't necessary to be that hateful against an entire people. Now, you may think I'm being, you know, I'm being a little picky, but it just seems to me like the woke idea that certain peoples are not deserving of respect because of some kind of historical uh, record. They're always, always scoring, like, oh, what the, what the bad things that the English do? What the bad things that this other, other uh, country do? It's all historical because it has nothing to do with, the, with current power, you know, current power versus prejudice is what they say. It has nothing to do with the people's current power. It's all about historical grudges. So yes, I think the English deserve as much respect as the Jamaicans do. So I think this author could have dialed it way back and criticized colonialism without being racist. Second thing about it is the use of footnotes. Now, this author, she was very scholarly. She attended Oxford, actually, she graduated from Oxford, and she's now attending Yale, so she's no dummy. So because of all this scholarly uh, background, she has footnotes in the text, which in the audiobook are read by a different narrator. And these kind of, in some cases, they elucidate uh, what's going on, but mostly they're a problem because they are often a, a way for the author to insert her opinion in a very blatant and unsubtle way. In some cases, uh, undermining the subtlety and the metaphorical power of her narration. For example, at one point, she actually states that uh, chattel slavery is 
exclusively an European invention. Well, if it had been a physical book, I would have thrown it across the room at that time. Because you know that's false. <laughs> and if there's any rationalization for that, it's something odd. Like, oh, well, the Middle Passage, where they, where they transported the slaves, was particularly brutal. But, you know, Islamic slavery was very brutal, and in some cases worse. And so it just seems to me that there was a lot of cases where she would make these really blatant and unsupported allegations, like, uh, Charles Dickens, though he was a talented writer, hated everybody who wasn't white. <laughs> okay, you take, you know, you look at some character who might have said something, and then you infer that the author is a racist, which is interesting. It's very relentless, and you get really tired of it. Now, at this point, I have to note that there is a difference between a racist book like Babel and a book that features a racist antihero like George MacDonald Fraser's Flashman series. The whole point of the latter is to mock Harry Flashman's bigotry, among other flaws that he has, which gets him into a lot of trouble as the series proceeds. Uh, there are many villains in these books, both white and non-white, but every group has its virtuous members, most of whom are braver than the cowardly Harry. So it's important to consider the author's intentions. But back to Babel. Now, in one case, it's in one sense, it's a lot like Light Ages, in which it's long, and which is could be a pacing problem. But this is more dramatic. There's a lot actually more going on, and there's a lot of interesting interaction between the four friends, which is what is good about it. I mean, there's a lot of really poignant things about their um, loyalty to each other through adversity. But just every time, even little children are racist because they'll they'll ask dumb questions like, "Can you see through those slanted eyes?" Well, this is a child. You know, the children are innocent. They don't mean anything by that. But of course, in the author's view, it's horrible. Uh, she should be more fair to the English because they weren't all bad. And even the good parts of the English, like abolitionism, oh, she basically dismisses them. Like people don't really care and they don't really understand. And they think that slaves were, you know, just children who had to be helped. <laughs> really, seriously. Uh, so any goodwill on the part of the English was just was just fake and, and patronizing. And so that's the one thing. She could have dialed that down. The second thing is that she should lose the, lose the footnotes. Even though a few of the footnotes are interesting uh, insights on language, which I enjoyed, a lot of them are just um, didactic nonsense. And even some of the regular reviewers have noticed this about the footnotes even though, to my knowledge, nobody's called them out on racism, like, like I'm doing right here, because that would be politically incorrect, right? The focus of this book is on how the translators realize that they're part of this oppressive system and decide that they have to do something to stop it and all the trouble this brings them. And in part, in, in additionally, all the conflict they have, which is at least good in the case of the, the four heroes, protagonists, they are human, they have flaws, and they do have a lot of different ideas, and some feel the pressure more acutely and some less. And uh, in the process, uh, Robin encounters this secret society called the Hermes Society, uh, which is fighting to undermine what the Oxford Translation Institute is doing in support of the empire. Now, of course, the worst thing that they're doing involves China, which is the soon to happen opium wars because the british are outraged that the chinese are deciding to outlaw opium importation because of all the problems it's been causing and they demand that china allow it in you know and to my mind yeah this was a horrible thing this was worse than taking over india because at least when they took over india they had some responsibility towards the people that they had conquered in this case, there's no responsibility. It's purely financial exploitation. And if it causes the Chinese society to fall apart, who cares? And in, in reality, in the real world, there were some very powerful families uh, who are still rich and powerful, uh, who benefited exclusively from the opium trade, which is the whole reason that, that uh, Britain went to war in the real world on this. And so it's understandable that Robin wants to stop this. But it's just, the, it's just the stridency, again, and it's the fact that 
just about every English person, we have a we encounter a couple exa examples, a couple exceptions near the end, is evil or or venal or selfish or something like that. Minus fanaticism, this is a compelling story with some strong characters uh, who do garner the reader's sympathy. The prose is beautiful, the descriptions are masterful, but that doesn't change its detractions. And as I said, this should not have won a nebula. The editor should have said, tone it down, lady, <laughs> seriously. But, you know, with political correctness, uh, it doesn't happen. I'm not in any way angry or resentful against Miss Kwong. She seems like a nice young lady. In fact, she's just giving the uh, elites, the literary elites, what they want, which is the ability to self-flagellate, like those monks from the Middle Ages who would whip themselves. I'm such a bad person. Whip, whip, whip. Well, that's exactly what she's giving them because that's what they want. But it's not what I want, and I think it's probably not what a lot of science fiction readers want. So I don't have any resentment towards her. I don't want people sending her, you know, no, um, ugly emails. <laughs> like it's it's a tough thing. I don't like to give negative reviews, and I really wish this book had been different. I really wanted to like this. I, I enjoy books by people from different backgrounds, and this woman is uh, apparently. I mean, she is plainly brilliant. She and the fact that she can write all these books while attending a very difficult university in a rather difficult subject, although it was a uh, sinology, study of her own culture, hmm. <laughs> or at least her parents' culture, because she grew up in America, I think. And, and anyway, you know, I just wish it could have been different. But in the current year, unfortunately, uh, the, this kind of thing is seen as okay and acceptable and wonderful. I'll give it no... No gears one way or the other. I'm not going to give it a rating. I just can't. I just can't. I, I would like to give it some for the writing skill, but no, I won't. So this has been my review of uh, uh, Babel and Arcane History, blah, 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 by Rebecca F. Kwong, and uh, my trepidation and misgivings about the book. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below and any suggestions for future shows I would greatly appreciate. And I have remembered the one about doing more history. I'm going to do one on Napoleon soon. Still in the works. So, you know, look for that. Also, please like and subscribe so we continue to get out the good steampunk slash sci-fi slash history word. Check out my books on Amazon. As always, I will have a list of the links in the description, and I am working on finally getting out a new book uh, sometime, hopefully, in the first quarter of 2024. For now, the Steampunk Test Pro saying adios, amigos, from the Steampunk Test Pro channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Mm -hmm.